So first question, true or false, is the Bible a human invention? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The Bible is a human invention, true or false? Is the Bible a human invention? True or false? I think it's true. Is the Bible a human invention, true or false? No. Is the Bible a human invention? Uh, the Bible is a human invention inspired by God. Bible is a human invention. True. False. No. No. A human invention? Yes, sir. True. Is the Bible a human invention, true or false? True. Okay. No. No. False. Do you think the Bible is a human invention? No. I don't believe it's a human invention. I believe it was inspired by God and give it to man. Yes, man did write it down, but it's straight from God. Howdy, Central. Let's all go buy our shoes from that guy. So we are starting a new short series. This is, I do this from time to time with these short series. It's not, it's not my preference. I prefer just preaching through a book of the Bible. That's my favorite thing to do. But I think it's important for us to just to address certain topics and see how passages of Scripture address those topics. And so today we're beginning this short series. There'll be five sermons called Objection, and we're going to be dealing with five common, I would say that some of the most popular objections that I hear and see like on the internet and in talking to people about the faith. For example, we're going to address the objection on one Sunday um, that the Bible is the cause of a lot of violence in the world. Have you heard that one? I've sure heard that. Um, how about this one? The church is full of hypocrites. Have you heard that one? Yeah. I, I just usually say, so is Walmart, and you go there. Uh, <laughs> But we're going to look at a more substantive response to that. So the first common objection we're going to look at is this. The Bible is a human invention. This is something that we hear a lot, that the, the Bible was not something divinely inspired. In fact, it wasn't this, uh, it's not this true story grounded in history. And basically, what happens when we hear this idea that the Bible is a human invention, there are a lot of, I guess, different ways to look at that. But the two main objections I hear within this objection is this. One, the Bible can't be trusted because it was written much later. In other words, we claim that all of the New Testament was written in the first century. That the Gospels were written, two of them, by eyewitnesses to everything that happened in the Gospels, and two of them by folks who knew those who were eyewitnesses. We believe that the letters attributed to the Apostle Paul were written by the Apostle Paul. Their letters attributed to John and Peter, written by John and Peter in a historical context. But there would say some who say, no, 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 man, we, you can't believe that. The Bible was composed hundreds of years after the fact. People will usually say 100, 150, 200, 300 years later is when the Bible was written. A second way people see the Bible as a human invention, and this is a fairly modern one, but it's become very, very popular, is this. Christianity is just a copy of pagan myths. In other words, all of these ancient Pagan peoples had all their false gods. We now know their myths, their mythological stories. But all the details of so many of these are exactly like the life of Christ. And so all Christianity was was just coming up with, with a new idea, a new twist on these pagan myths and putting the name Jesus on it. And for some reason, people decided to follow that. Now, whether you believe any of these objections or not, you might be wondering, does it really matter, Mike? Aren't these just academic debates? Isn't all that really matters is that we just love one another and keep the golden rule? I mean, and that's what's important. As Christians, we just need to love one another and we need to treat each other and treat others the way we want to be treated. Shouldn't we just focus on being the kind of people Jesus said that we should be? Years ago, G.K. Chesterton, who was uh, just a 
prolific writer and, and ended up being a Christian apologist, somebody who defended the faith, wrote a story called The Ball and the Cross. And in this or it, it was, he had a book called The Ball and the Cross. And then he tells this story of these two fictional characters. One guy was named Turnbull. And Turnbull was a very angry type, militant, outspoken atheist. And then there's another guy that's a very devout Christian named Macklin. Well, Turnbull was the editor of a paper, a newspaper called The Atheist. And he wrote an article attacking the virgin birth. And Macklin took great offense to it, so he threw a brick through the window of the newspaper. And these guys decided to challenge each other to a duel. Well, the book is this humorous, it, it tells this humorous story of these guys going back and forth all over Europe and all in, all in these British Isles trying to stage this duel, and they're getting thwarted all the time, and they ended up becoming two wanted men for wanting to duel because society said these guys are insane. They want to fight over something that is so inconsequential and insignificant as a religious matter. And only crazy people put that kind of life and death importance on religious matters. So they end up catching these guys and committing them to an insane asylum. But here's the punchline of the book. They're the only two sane people in society. The world has gone mad. Because Chesterton suggests, rightly so, that when society decides not to take with utmost seriousness the things of religion and eternity, it is either insane or delusional. You know, Blaise Pascal was a French philosopher in the 17th century, brilliant man. In fact, I recommend picking up his little book called Pensees. If you're taking notes, that's P-E-N-S-E-E-S. -E -E that's the French word for thoughts. After Blaise Pascal died, he was a brilliant mathematician and a physicist, and I mean, just had some groundbreaking discoveries. He was an inventor. But he was also a, a world-class Christian theologian. I mean, this guy, had he was a child prodigy, just had this brilliant mind. And after he died, in his study, people saw where on different pieces of paper, he had just jotted various thoughts down, and somebody compiled that into a book that we now know as Pensee. So it doesn't just read right through. It's just this random collection of thoughts. But from that comes what has come, become known as Pascal's Wager. How many of you ever heard that term, Pascal's Wager. Have any of you ever heard that? Only a few of you. Well, Pascal's Wager is often misrepresented, but here's what it really is. Pascal was making the argument that the claims of Christianity are so serious, everyone makes a gamble about them. And he says, you're either gambling that the claims of Christianity are inconsequential, and if you lose, you lose for all eternity. And so the smart thing to do is to begin walking in the ways of Jesus and exploring the claims of Christianity with utmost certainty because if you end up finding that the claims of Christianity are false, what have you really lost? But you stand to gain everything. You know, I find more and more, in fact, this was not true. It used to be you know, I became a Christian in 1987, and, and I would go out sharing the gospel with people, and I, I would ask people what they thought would happen when they die. And you know what? Every single person I ever talked to back then had given this serious consideration. Even the people who said, well, I'd go to hell. They had thought about it, and they had decided that was their best option, I guess. But more and more today, what I'm finding is I encounter people who just don't think about eternal matters. I say, have you ever considered this? No. Are you interested in it? No. Do you ever think about what happens when you die? No. Do you care what happens when you die? No. People just aren't thinking about it. In fact, I've been so encouraged. I've been talking to a young man over the last several weeks. We spent a few hours in conversation who's exploring the claims of Christianity. Now, I have met atheists that I've asked this question. If I can demonstrate to you that Christianity is true to the point that you believe it's true, will you become a Christian? I've had them say, absolutely not. So I asked him that question. If you discover that Christianity is actually true, will you become a Christian? He said, yes. Why do you think I'm doing this? Because if it's true, I need to know this, and I need to be on the right side here. And I appreciate 
the gravitas with which he is approaching that these things we're talking about matter. Today we're talking about what's true, how you know what's true, whether or not there's an eternal existence, what happens to each individual if there is some sort of afterlife. Not only that, but being a Christian is not just about a set of ethical principles. To become a Christian, you don't just choose one way of life over a smorgasbord of ways of life. To become a Christian, you have to accept, listen to this, to become a Christian, you need to accept the claims of Christianity not just as truthful facts, but as the very foundation of all reality. Then you have to bank your entire life and eternity on those truths, especially the truths that Jesus Christ died in your place as a substitute for your sins and rose from the grave three days later. This is about turning from all other claims to truth and life and surrendering your entire self to the living Savior who will transform form you from the inside out. So we're starting the series here with Scripture. We're going to talk about Scripture. Why? Because as Christians, we base everything on what's contained in the Bible. We just sang a song called I Believe. I love it. It's, it's pretty much a musical rendering of the Apostles' Creed, our confession of the faith, talking about what we believe. I love to engage with people and say, what do you believe? And when they tell me, I say, well, why do you believe that? And if somebody asks a Christian, what do you believe? And you say, well, I believe in the Trinity. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe Jesus rose from the grave. And they say to us, why do you believe that? We would say, what? The Bible tells me so. But we have to get under that question. Why in the world do we believe the Bible is true? Why do we believe that? See, if the Bible's not completely true, Christianity's a sham. If the Bible's not completely true, we might as well go home. So we're starting the series here, and I don't have time to cover everything dealing with the veracity of the Bible. I'm trying to touch on these things. But I wanted to begin with the most common and popular objections to the trustworthiness of the Bible, and to do that, we're going to look at a passage in the book of Acts. If you have your Bible... Please open it to Acts chapter 17. We're going to pick up on Paul's second missionary journey. On his first missionary journey, he stayed not that far from home. He went from from, uh, uh, from Palestine up into Asia Minor and back home, modern-day Turkey. But on his second journey, he actually crossed over and took the gospel to Europe. He went to Philippi, he went to Thessalonica, got run out of Thessalonica, went to Berea, got run out of Berea, and he went on to Athens without his companion Silas and Timothy. They stayed behind. So when he's in Athens, he's there, just, he's going to go ahead and wait for Silas and Timothy to show up, and he has a very interesting encounter that is relevant to what we're talking about today. Acts 17, beginning in verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens... His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, the Areopagus was the council of the people who were the moral and religious authorities of that day. Verse 21, now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Today they would be on Twitter all day. (laughs) So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God. They were just covering their bases. They wanted to make sure they hadn't left any out. What therefore you worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you. 
The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we who are his, indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance... God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Now, why would I choose this passage to respond to the claim that the Bible is a human invention? Well, I just tell you, we could have an all-day seminar and scratch the surface of the validity of the Bible and why we should believe the Bible is what it purports to be. But I want to show how the Bible itself does not allow for the objection we're looking at today to stand. This particular passage speaks to both ideas that the Bible is a later invention and that Christianity is just a copy of pagan myths. So first, the question, was the Bible written much later? Is the Bible just a bunch of stories, a work of fiction made up 100, 150, 200 years after the fact? Well, I hope to show you today that the Bible is an early, reliable, historical document. It is an early, and by early, I mean of the time it claims to be of, reliable, meaning accurate in what it teaches, historical document. And this is really important because the Bible, I mean, because Christianity is grounded in history if the Bible is not historically accurate. Christianity crumbles. So as we consider this passage, we should ask first if Acts is reliable as a historical document. So let's just consider that. We're reading from the book of Acts. Are we reading a work of fiction? Are we reading something that actually happened? Now, I'm not saying that we, I'm asking everybody just to believe everything that was said, but whether or not it was said. In other words, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Acts says that the apostle Peter said that salvation is found in no one but Jesus. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So, it's one thing to say, well, I disagree with Peter about that. I think there are a lot of ways to get to heaven. I don't think Jesus is the only way. It's one thing to say that, but it's another thing altogether to say Peter never said that. That never happened. That's a work of fiction. So before we look at what was said in the passage, let's consider whether this is even a reliable account. Did it happen? Did it happen? And if so, did it happen like it's written? I'll tell you, we have dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens. I mean, you can't imagine the wealth of data we have to believe that the book of Acts was written by one of Paul's companions, namely the physician Luke, in the first century. We don't have time for that. Let me me just give you a little bit. We have this embarrassment of riches for evidence. But I'm going to narrow it down to just some of the chapters leading right up to Acts chapter 17 and what's going into Athens. And I'm just going to give you some of the reasons to believe this was written in the first century since some of this information would not have been known in the second or third centuries. In Acts chapter 13, these are very small things, by the way. 
These are small things that you're writing something, you don't fake, you don't think to fake it. It's not a part of your story. It's not an important part of your story. These are just incidental details, you see. In Acts chapter 13, the writer of Acts describes accurately a sea crossing and various ports in use in the first century that were not in use 100 years later. In Acts 14, he records the spelling and language used in Lystra that had changed 100 years later. In Acts 15 and 16, all the right ports and travel specifics were first century. Acts chapter 16, he spelled Troas with a first century spelling that had changed by the time some claim Acts was written. Throughout Acts 16, there's more correct words, more correct spelling that only line up with the first century. Century. Same for Acts 17, even the decision to sail for Athens, which was the most convenient way to travel that direction because of the winds that time of year. In this passage that we're looking at, he describes first century Athens exactly the way it was in the first century. We know that language changes over time, right? We use words differently. Slang certainly changes. Think for a minute of the word bad. You remember bad used to be bad? And then when I was a teenager, bad was good. I don't know, is bad good or bad now? I'm not sure what it is. But it's a slang. You remember my generation, we used to watch the Flintstones and they had a gay old time? That meant something different then than it would mean in our culture today. Words change. Well, the term that we read translated babbler was a slang word that was not in use in the second century and that nobody would have had any reason to know from the first century. The reference to this court of philosophers and leaders and scholars being called the Areopagus, which means Mars Hill, the whole court was described that way, was called that way as a slang term in the first century. It wasn't so in the second century. All the language, all the names, all the titles, all the details are spot on. Y'all, we could do this all day. The details are so specific that it is not credible to assign the book of Acts to an author one to two hundred years later. You just can't do it. You can do it, but you have to be dishonest about it. This is why historians and archaeologists use the book of Acts as a primary resource for information about this specific region in the first century. There was an archaeologist named named William Ramsey. And Ramsey decided that he was going to prove once for all that the book of Acts was written in the second century. He was going to look at all the archaeological and historical data and demonstrate that it was a second century document. When he finished his work, he said this. We've got this quote here for you. Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy. This author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. This from a man who was going to disprove it. Almost universally, Acts is accepted as a trustworthy historical document. I say almost because you'll find somebody out there that doesn't want to believe it. So when we read this passage, what I'm doing here is I'm setting context. Okay? When did this happen? Can we trust that it happened? We can trust this is an accurate account of what happened. It doesn't mean you have to believe what Paul said. But I wish people would just say, yeah, I don't believe what Paul said, instead of coming up with fabrications and saying, well, that didn't really happen, when it did. What he said and where he said it decisively answers the second question. Is Christianity just a copy of pagan myths? Is Christianity just a copy of pagan myths? I want you to see how this passage completely dismantles the charge that the story of Jesus was just a rehashing of ancient myth stories. And I want you to see that Christianity is unique among all other religions ever. It is unique among all other religions in antiquity and in modern times ever. Let's consider some of these claims. I wonder if some of you have seen this meme. I still see this flying around. It's, it's actually in two parts. You'll see the second part on the next slide. But, but here, we see this going around with people who are just so much smarter than we knuckle-headed, naive, ignorant Christians. Horus, 
pagan god 5,000 years ago, was born of a virgin, had a star in the east, walked on water, healed the sick, restored sight, was crucified, dead for three days, resurrected. Mithra, same story, born of a virgin, burned on December 25th. Let me push pause. Nobody claims Jesus was born on December 25th. I love these kind of arguments. They don't even bother to ask what we believe. We celebrate his birth on December 25th. We know he was born in springtime. Let's pick back up. Star in the East, had 12 disciples, performed miracles. I'm going to push pause again. Of course he performed miracles. What kind of God does anybody ever worship that didn't perform miracles? So that's a non-starter to me. Dead for three days, though, resurrected. Wow. Krishna, 2,900 years ago, born of a virgin, star in the East, performed miracles, called son of God, son of a carpenter, resurrected. This is getting spooky, isn't it? Let's go to the next one. Dionysus, born of a virgin, born on December 25th. Uh Uh-oh. Traveling teacher turned water into wine called the Holy Child, Jesus Christ, all of the above. Wow, you get that come across. You go, man, is Jesus just a different name for all these other pagan belief systems? Let's go back and think about Athens for a minute. In verse 16 of chapter 17, Paul was walking around and saw that the city was, quote, full of idols. Do you know that one first century writer, by the way, that nobody disputes was a first century writer, said that in Athens it was easier easier to find a god than a man? The population of Athens in the first century was around 10,000. They had over 30,000 idols in the city. It was full of of, I, this is not even an overstatement. This isn't even hyperbole. It was literally full of idols. Every pagan god or goddess you can imagine from all over the world. You see, Athens was a cultural center. People from all over the world came there. They brought their religions there so that they could have these discussions and these debates because what did the Athenians do? They sat around talking all day long about what people believed and how people were supposed to live. This was an intellectual center. This is where the smart people went. This is where you found the most educated people in philosophy, religion, and morality. And this is where Paul's preaching the gospel. So Paul goes into this city where people know more about ancient pagan religions than than arguably any place on earth. He goes into this city, preaches the gospel. What does he say? He's telling them about Jesus and the resurrection. And what's the reaction of the people who knew more about ancient pagan myths than anyone on the planet? May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. What? What what, what about these guys? Dionysus, Krishna, Mithra, Horus. No, it's all the same thing, right? It's all the same stuff. And these smart people said, hey, this is new and strange. What? What? In fact, when Paul gets to the resurrection, he's got the Epicurean philosophers and the Stoic philosophers. These two guys, and I think those weren't the only two there. I think this was just representative of being across the board because here's what the Epicureans believe. The Epicureans believe that you indulge yourself, the finest food, the finest spirits, the finest interpersonal relationships you can have. You indulge in life. The Stoics, on the other hand, believe you did without You lived a life of restraint. That's where we get our word stoicism from. You don't indulge the flesh. They were as diametrically opposed as anybody. There was only one thing that the Epicureans and the Stoics agreed on. There was no such thing as a resurrection. So Paul gets to the resurrection, and that's when the conversation stops. But weren't they used to hearing about a god who died and three days later was resurrected over it. I mean, all of these pagan gods, they said it was something new. I mean, like, can you imagine somebody showing up at Harvard Law School and gathering the faculty there and going, hey, I've got a legal argument none of you have ever heard of, and they're going, wow, that's brand new. We've never heard of that. Or going to Johns Hopkins Medical School and saying, guys, you, 
Y'all don't know about brain surgery? Let me teach you about brain surgery. And them going, wow, we never heard of brain surgery. It'd be like going to MIT and bringing a new form of engineering that nobody had ever heard of. But we have to ask, what about these claims? I mean, it's just too big of a coincidence, isn't it? Well, let's go back to the meme over here. Let's go back to that first picture. What about Horace? Well, and bear in mind, we all know Horace is a fictional character. But in the stories of Horace, his mother was married to her brother. She wasn't a virgin. There's no historical reference to a star in the east. No reference to Horus ever walking on water. About the healing the sick, he actually cast spells on people that made them sick, and Isis and Thoth had to heal them. He was never crucified. He was never resurrected. In fact, he didn't even die. He merged with the sun god, Ra. Hmm. What about Mithra? Well, he was born fully grown from a solid rock. I don't know if the rock had been with anybody else or not. He was born either in September or October. Again, who cares? There's no historical reference to a star in the east. No historical account of him having 12 disciples. No reference of him of him having ever died, let alone any belief in a resurrection. Uh oh What about Krishna? Well, he was the eighth son of the royal Mathura family. I would say his mother was not a virgin. His father was not a carpenter. No historical reference to a star in the east. No mention of a resurrection at any time in literature. What about Dionysus? His mother was a mortal, impregnated by Zeus in the normal way. He died every winter and was resurrected every spring. So there was that. Um, he was never called a traveling teacher or a holy child, but he did turn water into wine a lot. Do you know why? Dionysus was the god of wine. So, of course, he turned water into wine. Then where did all this come from? And why are so many people believing it? Do you know we can pinpoint with accuracy where all of these claims originated? An obscure 2000 film called Zeitgeist. Movie called Zeitgeist. I wonder if any of you ever saw it. Anybody ever see Zeitgeist? Well, don't don't bother. I mean, watch it if you want. But if I told you to watch it, you'd get mad at me. It was written by a guy named Peter Joseph, who's a conspiracy theorist who believes the 9/11 attacks were either orchestrated or tolerated. I mean, encouraged by the United States government. He also believes that there is an international banking cabal that is responsible for the sinking of the Lusitania, which brought us into World War I. This same international banking cabal pulled the strings and engineered the attack on Pearl Harbor. This same banking canal was responsible for the Gulf of Tonkin incident that brought us into Vietnam. So, of course, there's a conspiracy behind Christianity. This is where people are getting their information and trying to debunk the largest and, might I add, fastest growing religion in the world. Now, I know a lot of you keep hearing Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. It is not. Christianity is. And you know where it's growing the fastest? In Islamic countries. So why do people believe this stuff so easily? I think people just want to believe anything that doesn't make them confront Jesus. People are so eager to undermine Christianity that they'll resort to any kind of nonsense and they'll spread the misinformation either because they, don't, they know it's not true or they just don't care to put any effort into discovering the truth. But since this has been so easily debunked, a new charge is emerging. How many of you have ever heard the name Bart Ehrman? Bart Ehrman is a legitimate New Testament scholar. He is a professor of religion at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And if you ever watch the shows like on the History Channel or whatever that are the search for the historical Jesus, he's the guy they put on to tell you why you shouldn't believe in Jesus. He's their go-to guy. Well, in one of his books, he admits that he sets out to unravel the Christian faith of his incoming students. That's one of his goals, to keep them from being Christians. 
With his freshman religion class, he says he begins with this story. He says, let me tell you about a man. Before he was born, his mother had a visitor from heaven who told her that her son would not be a mere mortal, but in fact would be divine. His birth was accompanied by unusual divine signs in heaven. As an adult, he left his home to engage on an itinerant preaching ministry. He gathered a number of followers around him who became convinced he was no ordinary human, but that he was the Son of God. He did miracles to confirm them in their beliefs. He could heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. At the end of his life, he aroused opposition among the ruling authorities of Rome and was put on trial. But they could not kill his soul. He ascended to heaven and continues to live there to this day. To prove that he lived on after leaving his earthly orb, he appeared again to at least one of his doubting followers who became convinced that, in fact, he remains with us even now. Later, some of his followers wrote books about him, and we can still read about him today. And he says to the students, who am I talking about? And they all say, Jesus. And he says, no, I'm talking about Apollonius of Tyana. He's trying to convince them Jesus is nothing original. Here's the thing. Apollonius of Tyana was a real first century man. He was a Roman philosopher who was born about 20 years after Jesus was born. And he was completely obscure. But in 225, there was an empress named Julia Domna. And Julia Domna hated the Christians. So she hired a guy named Philostratus and paid him. She said, you need to come up with a competing story that people can believe in of a real Roman God so these people will stop following this Jewish preacher named Jesus. So he had seen some writings of Apollonius, Apolli take two, Apollonius, I'm using a lot of old names today, and uh, he wrote the story. Now, Ehrman knows this, he admits it, no one denies this, but in the story that Philostratus wrote, there was no heavenly messenger announcing his birth. The messenger came from Egypt, not the same as heaven. He never said Apollonius would be divine. He was never an itinerant preacher. In fact, he took a vial of silence for several years as he began his journeys. His miracle claims were dubious. In fact, Apollonius doesn't say he performed miracles. He said some people say that he performed these miracles. And in fact, the one miracle that's his biggest claim to fame was raising a little girl from the dead. And Apollonius says in the writing, but she wasn't really dead in the first place. Apollonius was not put on trial. He was not killed by Roman authorities. He did not rise from the dead. He did not appear to his followers. And none of his followers wrote books about him. When you hear this stuff, you are being lied to. Now, here's the difference between me and them. I'm going to tell you, don't believe what your preacher says. Go look it up. You can go find the historical writings about Apollonius that Philostratus wrote. You can go read all about all these pagan gods and goddesses. The information's out there for anybody who cares to look. The simple truth is every one of the claims of the story being a copy, the story of Jesus being a copy, are 100% without substance. They are false, completely untrue, and this is why contemporary religious scholars called the gospel a new teaching containing strange things. And not only is this passage an accurate account of what happened when Paul visited Athens, but we can draw some reasonable conclusions. It's an accurate account of all the religious scholars calling this story of Jesus a new teaching. But here's what we need to ask now. What is this passage teaching us? It's teaching us that Christianity is true. Christianity is set in history. The claims of Christianity were made before eyewitnesses in less than friendly settings at great risk to the followers who made those claims. So much of the Bible was written by eyewitnesses and the rest of the Bible was written by contemporaries to the eyewitnesses. That's why the Bible can withstand all this scrutiny. Don't you think if the Bible, if the story of Jesus was just another myth, it would have gone the way of all the other myths today? How many of you know a Horus worshiper? How many of you know a Dionysus worshiper? How many of you know an Apollonius worshiper? Those have all gone by the wayside. Why? Because they're fictional stories. Jesus has stood the test of time. Christianity has stood the test of time because it is true. 
The philosophers of Paul day, Paul's day examined it closely. The Roman Empire attempted to destroy it for the last 2,000 years. The claims of Christianity have been tested and tested, and governments have tried to kill it. And no one's been able to undermine the faith of the apostles because it's true. Christianity has stood the test. Christianity is true. Christianity is unique. Over 30,000 idols in that city and not one of them even remotely similar to the gospel message of Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died for our sins, rose from the grave, sits at the right hand of the Father. Nothing similar. And it's still unique among all other religions. There's no other religion in the world that has God coming to you. Every other religion in the world, whatever their version of God or deity or deification is, you have to do something to get there. People are trying to get to God. In Christianity only, He comes comes to us. It's the only one. No other religion in the world has a God atoning for our sin. Every other religion has a way that you have to deal with your sin, you have to atone for your sin, you have to have some kind of penance, except Christianity. God himself pays the penalty that we owe to him for our sin. No other religion in the world has salvation that is by grace through faith. Every other religion in the world, whatever their concept of salvation, is a works-based burden that is placed on you. Only in Christianity are we told, believe in Jesus, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's nothing close. Nothing close. No other religion has ever been remotely similar. Therefore, all other beliefs are false. If Christianity is true, and the preponderance of evidence leads us to believe it is, and if Christianity is unique, and that's just a simple fact then all other belief systems and philosophies of life must be false because they all run contrary to Christianity. And so if Christianity is true and unique, if all other beliefs are false, then no one can claim that Christianity and the claims of Christianity are of no consequence. C.S. Lewis said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Therefore, here's our takeaway today. The Bible is trustworthy and true, so you need to take its claims seriously. The Bible is trustworthy and true, so you need to take its claims seriously. This passage gives us some heavy, heavy claims to consider. Let's look again at verses 30 and 31. Paul says, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. I want you to look at these claims. We're just going to leave this scripture up there, and I want you to look at there's three claims in here that you need to take seriously today. Number one, God commands everyone to repent. Isn't that interesting? He commands all people everywhere to repent. You know what this means? This means that every human being needs to repent. This means that every human being is guilty of sin. This means that every human being has offended God. Our sin is not an oopsie-daisy. Our sin is high treason against God himself, our very creator. And he is commanding every human being, turn from your sin and be saved. We are commanded to turn, to reject our empty way of life, our empty way of religion, and turn and embrace Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. He commands all people everywhere to repent, and that means everyone in this room. Secondly, he assures us that judgment is coming. He has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. Don't you get, I've seen this bumper sticker, only God can judge me. I want you to think about that. Only God can judge me. Y'all, that's the last person you want judging you. Because his judgment will be final and eternal. And he has fixed a day. We don't know when it is, but he does. He has fixed a day where every human being who has ever lived is going to stand before him and be judged in righteousness. And let me tell you, 
You will either be judged by your own righteousness or by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the only way to escape being judged by your level of righteousness is to place your faith in Jesus Christ alone. And look at this audacious claim. He has proved his, his claims by raising Jesus from the dead. Of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Frankly, when people talk to me and I get to talk to skeptics and we get to talking about the why question, my bottom line answer is I can't get away from the resurrection of Christ. Jesus went around saying over and over, I'm going to be killed and three days later I will rise from the grave. This was prophesied centuries before Jesus ever lived that this would happen. And now it is a historically verifiable fact that Jesus Christ was crucified, was dead, and rose from the grave. And if Jesus Christ said he was going to die and rise from the grave, if prophecies for centuries say he's going to die and rise from the grave, and he actually died and rose from the grave, you need to take everything else he said seriously. You can't avoid it. It gives credibility to everything. You can try to deny the claims of Christianity. You can walk away from them like some of these people who just mocked and walked away. You can try to suppress the claims of Christianity. You can try to silence Paul. You can try to silence all the signals you're getting. But Christianity is true. You can treat it as inconsequential, but I plead with you today not to. And so I ask you today, if you're unsure, if you've been a skeptic for whatever reason, today would you believe the truth? Would you accept the claims of Christ as true? Would you repent of your sin, of your empty way of life? And would you embrace Jesus Christ with your whole heart? Would you do it today? Let's pray. Holy Father, the Apostle Paul made some audacious claims here that we cannot ignore. The evidence overwhelmingly tells us this is an accurate account, and the reason and logic of it all tells us that we need to believe it. But we know that sometimes our hearts wage war in us. And I pray that you would overcome every objection, every barrier, anything holding anybody back in this room today. That they would be aware that you are commanding them right this second to repent and warning them that you have fixed a day which could very well be today when you will judge the entire world and that what you say is true and will come to pass. God, soften hearts that are hardened toward you We pray in Jesus' name, amen.